Uh, welcome everyone to our first Safe Passage webinar for 2023. We're glad to see you here. Um, just a little background, we are going to have um, a monthly webinar in 2023. We're gonna not have them bi-weekly anymore, um, just monthly uh, in order to uh, just make sure we, we can uh, do the programming for them. Do Abder hold in. I'm sorry. <laughs> And, um, you know, as you can see, Sue Abderholden is our guest today. Uh, before I introduce her, I'm going to give you a little information about next month's webinar, which is going to be with uh, two people, um, Michelle Chalmers and April Gresham at the State Department of Human Services. Worth a little bit of explanation of this one. Uh, they are working on recodifying foster care licensing requirements. And this is a really important task that is basically comes out of some work that Safe Passage did uh, along with foster advocates uh, during the last legislative session, not 2022, but 2021. And the basic project there was to um, reduce the kind of uh, requirements, uh, disqualifiers for becoming a foster parent that had to do with past felonies. Uh, so that the some things were reduced from like a lifetime ban to a shorter ban, et cetera. Uh, so that people who had moved to a different place in their life could become foster parents, particularly kinship foster parents, if they were at a place where they could provide a nurturing and safe environment. So uh, part of the deal was that Safe Passage uh, insisted on having qualitative uh, guidelines for screening and um, you know recruiting foster parents, so that we really looked at whether a person was was at this point really able to to do that well. And it was kind of, instead of the guide rails being uh, specific uh, requirements about past felonies, it was more qualitative in nature. So the state has been doing what I think is a really good job of going through this process, including all the stakeholders, managing the process well, very, and uh, I've been involved with uh, most of the sessions. So I just wanna, you know, kind of shout out to the state people for doing really good work on this. But one of the things that's come out of it is that um, changing the requirements and the guidelines is, is great, but the Child Welfare Training Academy has to have the capacity to actually train people to do it, and it's never been fully funded. So it raises a new priority for us to, to get them funded. So I think this is an important step in, in really um, you know, developing standards in child protection and foster care. It's one of our you know, significant um, achievements in terms of legislation. So I hope you can show up. That's going to be on February 22nd. So with that, I think most of you have been part of these in the past. We have a presenter who, who uh, does that. And then we have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, and so, uh, you know, make note of your questions as we go. And today we have Sue Abder Holden, who I think most of you know is the executive director of NAMI of Minnesota. And NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And she provides direction and leadership. And particularly, we have known her as being a consistent presence at the Minnesota legislature during the legislative sessions, where for a number of years, she has advocated with a great deal of success uh, for an expansion of mental health services in Minnesota uh, across the board, but including for children and for school-based services uh, and other things that are really important. She's been really successful. In that regard, I, you know, I kind of try to take lessons from her in terms of how she actually get these legislators to pay attention and move. Uh, she has been NAMI's executive director since 2001. So I guess maybe longevity is part of her secret. But um, she's, uh, we really, uh, Sue, appreciate you being here. Sue is at the legislature and actually was saying, I hope this is okay to share, that her laptop is, she's on her phone because her laptop is actually in a hearing being used by her staff that, where she just testified. So she's really, you know, stretching here to, uh, you know, jump out and, and find a, play, a, pace, a place in the Capitol where she can sit down and talk and hopefully not get interrupted. So with that, Sue, let me let you get started and uh, welcome to our, to our webinar. Great. Thanks so much. And I'm hoping you can pull up the PowerPoint because I can't do it from my phone. Oh, Stephanie, can you do that? I guess we haven't... Uh, talked about that yet. Oh, or I can do no, she, I just she can do it. It just might take a second, okay. right? Stephanie? Yeah, okay. I'll pull it up, Sue. So go yeah, ahead. She'll pull it up. up. Okay, okay. great. Hi, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, I apologize. I didn't expect that um I was going to have a hearing today at one o'clock that went till 2 30. So 
It's kind of what happens sometimes at the Capitol. Um, so I wanna talk about children's mental health. And first I really wanna talk about the impact of the pandemic because it really has increased our need to address children's mental health. So we had children who as a parent, as a frontline worker, and so they were really nervous about, you know, their parent, you know, catching COVID or being hospitalized for it. Um, we had children experiencing a lot more adverse childhood experiences as well, in terms of food insecurity, um, you know, being isolated at home, those kinds of things. And then there's also what I would call ambiguous loss. So, you know, we had um, a lot of meaningful events that were canceled, things like, you know, funerals and weddings and even things like high school graduation. Um, also, um, uh, kids who, you know, thought they were going off to college and didn't get to do that either. Um, and if you can advance the slides for me too, sorry. I had no idea that I was gonna be stuck at the Capitol. Um, next slide. Um, the other thing that we saw too as well um, is that we had over 200,000 children across the country who lost their caregiver. So that also was a pretty traumatic thing for, um, thing for children. We had um, kids who couldn't connect to the internet, so they were particularly isolated. We know that people from BIPOC communities um, were more impacted by the pandemic than others. Um, you know, for instance, uh, people from um, the black community caught COVID at a higher rate, were hospitalized at a higher rate and died at a higher rate. A lot of LGBTQ youth actually lost their support, especially if their family um, was not supportive. We know George Floyd's murder had a huge impact. And then, you know, people from the Asian community getting attacked in Walmart parking lots, being blamed for COVID. And also just things that we're seeing now in terms of gun violence, you know, how many mass shootings um, every week, the war in Ukraine is, you know, pretty depressing. Um, you know, you have young people concerned about climate change. And I think there's this overall meanness, frankly, in our society. You know, you, you see signs up saying, please be nice. These are the employees that showed up. And all of that impacts um, our mental health. Next slide. The CDC data is, you know, pretty impactful. So 37% of high school students reported they have poor mental health. You know, 44% reported they were sad or hopeless. 55% um, reported verbal abuse by parents in the home, 11% physical abuse. 29% reported a parent losing a job and that economic uncertainty can certainly be an impact. 34% experienced racism, which also has an impact on mental health. And then 26% were experiencing suicidal thoughts and 12% attempted. Next slide. The Minnesota Student Survey is also kind of a, a way to kind of peek into how are our kids doing. And again, the data is not good. Um, we really saw, you know, 6% increase in the number of students experiencing long-term mental health problems. Um, the number of 11th graders, <laughs> seriously. Who are covered in snow? What are you doing out there? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I would, if, we'll if people could mute, here. perhaps. Yeah. Um, and then just, you know, the suicidal thoughts, you know, that increased. And then again, we saw our LGBTQ plus students were three times more likely to report seriously considering suicide and four times more likely to actually attempt. Next slide. Uh, Trevor Projects had the same kind of the similar um, experience in terms of the LGBTQ students. So again, those students are really, really struggling with their mental health right now. Next slide. Um, kids Count data also found anxiety and depression up um, about almost 15% in Minnesota, although our overall child well-being ranked third. Next slide. The Child Mind Institute also kind of looked into things and found that black teens, 22% aren't comfortable discussing mental health with anyone. Um, although 67% of all youth were hopeful that they could adapt and rebound. And I think that's certainly a good sign. And kids who had a mental illness before the pandemic were not surprised, right? It actually became worse. And so that also is certainly um, concerning. Next slide. Um, some other national surveys, uh, parents are really seeing that their kids are struggling. 71% said the pandemic took a toll on their kids' mental health. We saw emergency room visits go way up. 24% um, of kids 5 to 11 and 31% for those 12 to 17 compared to 2019. Those are huge increases. 51% um, increase in girls attempting suicide. Um, and of course, we know suicide among Native youth is very high 
and Black and Latina girls are twice as likely to attempt suicide as boys. Next slide. Um, just some other data that we know, inpatient admissions went up and um, unfortunately the in-person office and outpatient didn't go up very much, but we know actually that the boarding in the ER sometimes has taken days and weeks, sometimes months uh, for a child to find the right place to go. Next slide. And so what we've seen um, in terms of the impact on youth, we've seen a lot of developmental delays, especially among young children, you know, not knowing how to, you know, focus, not knowing how to share those kinds of things, a lot of dysregulation, you can hear it in the schools for kindergartners, you know, first graders as well, a lot of sleep disturbances, and of course, good sleep is important to mental health, changes in appetite, um, a lot of increased irritability, especially with little kids, and we also saw that solitary substance use increase, and I think we can all know that, you know, while we're not necessarily wanting kids to be together when they're doing these things, there is safety in numbers in terms of being able to watch if things go, go south. Interesting, we saw that ADHD diagnoses went down, which kind of makes sense, right? If you're at home, you can be standing up and moving around and you're not necessarily a distraction in the classroom, but they did see that OCD and tick disorders actually went up. And then while kids mainly wanted to go back to school, there was also anxiety about going back to school, especially if you were a child who perhaps was bullied or felt um, left out. Next slide. And of course, what we're seeing is that, you know, every story is a little bit different. So again, with kids who had serious mental illnesses, it, it, it just got worse. Um, but we also saw some children who were actually more resilient. Um, they thrived because they had more sleep. There was more flexibility in their scheduling. There was less bullying because they weren't actually at school. And then a lot of kids would just kind of fall in between. Um, I would say that some children were impacted a little bit more be just because of their nature. We all know that, right? Some kids are more sensitive than others. Um, you know, there's the economic status thrown in there, you know, all of these things. And we know, of course, that trauma compounds trauma. The one thing I did want to mention, next slide, is that the pandemic also impacted adults. And the reason I wanted to make sure that people realize this is because adults have an impact on children's mental health, right? So it, whether it's a parent, you know, a teacher, a social worker who's working with kids, our mental health impacts them. And what we saw is that the World Health Organization said that um, depression and anxiety increased 25% across the world. Even among adults, we saw, you know, over a third had difficulty sleeping um, and difficulty eating. They said there was a 12% increase in alcohol use, but I really think that's a whole lot more and people just lied because we know about the, um, the increase in sales in liquor stores. And we saw more women struggling than men. And they hypothesized that it's because more women were tasked with distance learning. So they were trying to do their work and do distance learning at the same time. And then we had a, hot, a lot more younger adults, 16 or 18 to 26, who had suicidal ideation. And I think part of that is those are the youth whose, you know, kind of future was most impacted, whether it was graduation, going, you know, getting a job um, and going off to college. Next slide. So now I want to talk a little bit about our mental health system and, and how this all kind of interacts. Um, I do want to say that our mental health system is not broken. We need to stop saying that. We never had one. The institutions were not a mental health system. We have been, you know, carefully trying to build our mental health system, you know, for over 40 years. And part of the problem is the funding. So we all know that private insurance does not cover all the services that children need. Health plans in Minnesota do not cover psychiatric residential treatment facilities. And yet we know that that is the place that kids with really complex needs need to go. Um, Medicaid um, actually discriminates as well. Um, you know, they have the thing called the IMD exclusion Institute for Mental Disease. So we see a lot of our facilities having 16 beds because of that, because if it's over that and over half the people are being treated for mental illness or um, substance use disorder, you can't use Medicaid. The other thing with TEPRA or the Katie Beckett waiver is that the eligibility criteria for a child with a developmental disability versus a child with a mental illness is different. And kids with a mental illness need hospital level of care in order to get on the Katie Beckett waiver. So we have far fewer families on Medicaid um, if they're middle income than if they had a child with a developmental disability. We've also had to rely on county funds and state grants, and that's not how we fund other parts of our healthcare system. And so that makes it also really difficult. And, you know, honestly, 
if you don't have money, you cannot build a mental health system. You can't operate on charity, right? And so this has been really problematic that we've not been able to get um, true funding streams um, in to build our mental health system. Next slide. So one of the things I wanna talk about is, is actually what do we have? Because what I often find is that people think about hospitals and day treatment maybe and residential and they don't know all the other things that actually exist. And this has all been a part of us trying to build our mental health system. So we all know about outpatient treatment, right? Therapy, very important. Of course, we have you know, very limited networks under private insurance. And now, right now I hear families waiting nine to 12 months to even see a therapist. Um, the legislature just recently dropped the um, eligibility criteria for dialectical behavior therapy below 18. Before it had been 18 and above, now it's below that. So for kids who really need that because of their, again, more complex needs, they'll be able to get it under Medicaid. Day treatment is also a really important part of our mental health system for kids. Um, the problem is it can be difficult to get there. And sometimes schools won't do the transportation. Um, Non-emergency medical transportation isn't always, you know, frankly, um, appropriate for kids to take, uh, depending on their needs. And so it can, it can be difficult for families to get there. Um, partial hospitalization is also certainly very helpful. Um, intensive outpatient treatment, the same thing. As you all know, we don't have enough inpatient beds. I think it's helped that Children's Hospital added, you know, around 22 beds this last fall. Um, but clearly we need more. And frankly, every children's hospital, I think actually every hospital should have inpatient beds so that families um, can be closer to where their children are. We do have mobile crisis teams that serve all 87 counties and they do serve children and adults. I would agree that they don't often serve children well. And so, you know, we, it's something that we're gonna be working on this session. But last session, we added crisis beds. We didn't have crisis bed for kids. And so if you had a child who really didn't need hospital level of care, but needed something else and not necessarily long-term residential, there was nowhere for them to go. So this is a new service that will start coming online. And I think it will be really helpful. As you all know, we have residential treatment, um, you know, along with PRTFs and medication management and telehealth. I will say that telehealth hasn't worked as well with children, especially young children. It's not like watching a Disney movie, right, on the laptop. It's a little bit different and harder to really kind of engage them in that as well. Next slide. Medicaid is really the funder, frankly, of um, more intensive services for kids. But again, if we can't get those families on Medicaid, um, especially right now, the SMIRT team, the, the, um, the uh, uh, Medicaid review team, um, it can take nine months now to get smirted and be certified as having a disability. And so that's a long time for families to wait for their child to get on Medicaid and to access these services. We do have behavioral health homes, which are virtual homes, and they're really kind of a way to coordinate services for children who might also have health care needs in addition to mental health needs. We do have in-home services, children's therapeutic services and supports, the CADI waivers, which is a, another way to do it intensive behavioral health treatment services, which can now go to all families and not just foster families. There's case management and targeted case management. We have therapeutic foster care, again, PRTFs, um, clinical care consultation. So a pediatrician or a family physician can actually um, confer with an a adolescent child or adolescent psychiatrist to get advice on how to actually treat a child. And we have such a shortage of child psychiatrists that we really need to be able to do that. I will note that um, President Eisenhower was one of the first presidents to put forward like a huge plan to build our mental health system. And in that plan, they said that we needed to do more to get more child psychiatrists because we didn't have enough. So we've actually known since President Eisenhower that we haven't had enough child psychiatrists. We have a program called Hospital InReach, um, which actually, because of the way it's funded, no one uses, but it was supposed to be a way that you could actually support a child coming out of the emergency room um, and providing services in the home for a specified period of time. And then Youth Act, Youth Assertive Community Treatment, um, Act teams are really about kind of like a hospital without walls. And so we had Youth Act for 16 to 21 year olds. And we, um, we did expand that down to age eight. And then we wanted to expand it up to age 26 because cutting off those services for a youth who has serious mental illnesses at 21 seemed like a really bad idea. And uh, talking to youth too, they're like, 
you know, I'm just, I'm just entering this kind of new period of my life as an, a, a young adult. And now you're going to take away all my services. Next slide. We also have what I would call grant funded or braided funding. Um, so that we try to look at Medicaid where we can and private insurance, but also have grant money to help. Early child mental health consultation is certainly one of them. Um, again, going to where children are in the child care settings to help them and make sure that we don't, um, frankly, keep suspending kids um, out of preschool. Um, School Link is one of my favorite programs, honestly. Um, and so this started back in um, 2007 with the first grants. And the way that these grants work is that the grants actually go to a community mental health provider who then co-locates in the school. So we have a firewall, frankly, between educational records and healthcare records, um, which is important. Um, the provider can actually build private and public insurance. It's not just limited to special ed kids. And so they can also follow the kid back into the community and they can offer services year round, not just when school is in session. Obviously, they work closely with the school support personnel, school social workers, psychologists, counselors, um, but these are the kids who need to be diagnosed and treated. What this did for families is it removed barriers. So school is often a place that families know, so they trusted it. Um, but some families, you know, if you think about an average length of treatment, you know, 27, 30 weeks of therapy, not every family could take off of work once a week for that many weeks, right? They, people, families lost their jobs or their children couldn't complete treatment. Um, and, you know, what do you do, right? You have to be able to put food on the table and, you know, pay for your housing and things like that. Um, so this really helped. And the grant money pays for children who are uninsured or underinsured. And so we see a lot in suburban districts where families might have high deductibles, you know, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000. This allows those kids to actually get treatment. We then carried that idea over to ShelterLinked um, a couple of sessions ago because it seemed like the same thing. Youth in a shelter, many are struggling with their mental health, um, but how are they going to make an appointment, right, to go to a clinic? And so this way, the mental health professionals can be there in the shelter um, providing support um, to the youth and actually the staff as well. And I think with both of these programs, what you're seeing is the child in their own milieu, which actually I think means you can provide better treatment. Um, first episode of psychosis is all, always really important too. Um, so if you think about it, the way that we've treated um, a young person, and you know this can go down to 14, um, a young person experiencing their first psychotic episode, schizophrenia is one of the most disabling conditions in the world. And we did nothing when someone had their first psychotic episode, right? We waited until they were hospitalized numerous times or committed before we would step in and do anything. And so what the first episode programs do is try to um, connect with that um, child or young person early. Um, the average length of wait times between you know, hearing voices or hearing voices, you know, seeing things um, is about 72 weeks. That is way too long. So they try to intervene early and they intervene intensively so that young person gets therapy, um, they get um, cognitive remediation on the computer, um, they're in school support, they're in peer support groups. Um, and then there's a person on the team that helps that young person get back to school or work. And they also provide the education and support to the families too. Very successful. We only have four programs in Minnesota. We need at least eight. Um, so this is something that we keep working on to get more money, state money for. On the federal level, we have to use 10% of our federal block grant to fund these programs, but that's not enough to build out what we need. And then respite care is so important. I was actually a respite care provider in Hennepin County for over a decade. And what you'd see is when families came on a Friday, right, to drop their child off, they looked exhausted and they were. And then they come back on Sunday night and they had a chance to maybe sleep, you know, clean their house, go out on a date with their spouse, whatever it is, they come back refreshed. And what we know is if we can keep refreshing people's batteries, they can actually withstand more. Um, you all know that if you've ever been a parent, right? When you're totally, you know, super tired, um, you don't deal well, <laughs> right? If your kid is really struggling um, or there's a lot more noise and things like that. So respite care is really important. And then a newer program is Collaborative Intensive Bridging Services to really help kids who go into residential treatment bridge, have those services bridging so that they can come home much, much more easily. Next slide. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is our certified community behavioral health centers and of course our mental health centers as well. Those are very important. 
Um, the CCBHCs often are getting people in much earlier than any other place because of the way that they're funded. The Children's Mental Health Collaboratives was really a way to make sure that everyone on the local level was coming together to plan for some of those services and supports that you wouldn't get other places. And then we need to continue, you know, to focus on um, creating more culturally specific providers. We have what's called the CMIG grants, um, which really help um, us develop them as well. Next slide. Um, so again, what we're seeing in terms of barriers to all those services that are really good is the Medicaid rates are really low, which makes it hard for our providers to really stay solvent and hire people. That TEFRA timeline is ridiculous. Mental health parity is not enforced. Um, the workforce shortage and the lack of diversity in our workforce also means that we're, we're just not doing well. Next slide. Um, we know that even prior to the pandemic, only about 20% of kids actually received the care that they needed. And we kind of go down in terms of LGBTQ youth, um, children from the BIPOC community, you know, they're not able to access the care that they need. One of the things that we've seen more recently, was, which is um, very concerning, and we plan to address this, is that if a parent has a child in the emergency room, perhaps they have severe aggression. The hospital says they don't need inpatient level of care. You need to bring your child home. And they say, I can't bring my child home. I don't have services in place. Um, I can't keep my child safe. I can't keep my other children safe. Those families are being referred to child protection for neglect. And we're trying to say those parents are neglecting their children. The system is neglecting their children and they shouldn't be thrown into the child protection system. Um, we are seeing delays in kids being discharged from the hospital because there's nowhere for them to go. Um, again, long waiting lists for therapy. And even our school-linked mental health services, which are so great, often by November have waiting lists. So we know that we just have a lot more kids who need care. Next slide. The other thing I wanna mention is that there um, are some specific kids, and we've known about this for a long time, that are just, our system really doesn't meet their needs. So it's kids who are, you know, have, are in the autism spectrum. Um, they have self-injury, injurious, injurious behaviors or aggression. Um, kids with reactive attachment disorder, PTSD with aggression, uh, a co-occurring disorder of mental illness and developmental disabilities and conduct disorder, mental illnesses with brain trauma, whether it's TBI or fetal alcohol, um, mental illnesses and complex medical issues, uh, borderline personality features, severe emotional dysregulation and early onset schizophrenia. Um, those kids in particular, our system doesn't meet. And if you think about kids with a developmental disability or an intellectual disability, maybe their IQ is at 50, if they're not able to actually participate in therapy, what else do we have? And, and that's really problematic. Next slide. But I'm always optimistic that there's things um, that we can do. So um, I don't look at the glass to say, is it half full or half empty? I'm just always glad that there's water in it. So I'm going to talk about some of the legislative issues we're looking at this session. Next slide. Um, so we're going to work on workforce. We've actually done a lot of things the last two years, and we want to continue to build on them. Um, some of that is loan forgiveness programs for mental health professionals. Um, we have about 3,000 people who graduate, but then don't go, do, don't go on to get their license. We know one of the issues is they can't afford to pay for supervision. So we have a program that would actually pay for supervision. Um, we want to create a mental health and substance use disorder education center. So we have a small office within the Department of Health that really focuses on the mental health workforce, um, looking at what's the diversity, how do we get young people kind of interested in these careers, things like that. We want to create a mental health training program for pediatricians, um, where as part of their residency, they're working alongside child psychiatrists in a clinic so they can really learn um, what they can do. And then we save, again, those more complex needs for the um, actual child psychiatrist. Um, we want to make sure that we can do clinical supervision outside clinic walls under the Merck program. And we need a lot more family peer specialists that would really add a lot to our workforce, along with um, uh, young adults as peer specialists as well. And then we have a, a bill that would create Grow Your Own. So we've seen that in the education system, right? Where we look at paraprofessionals who are working in special ed, they know what the job is like, let's help them become special ed teachers. Well, maybe you have a receptionist who is working in a mental health clinic, they're working and interacting with families and people with mental illness all day. And they're like, you know what? I think I'd like to become a social worker. We would help pay for their college education to do that. Um, another thing we wanna do is enforce mental health parity. 
um, we think that is um, especially important um, to make sure that families who have insurance are actually get to use it. We want to put those um, that CMIG grant that I mentioned um, in statute with money, um, hopefully 10 to $20 million, so that we can really build out our diverse mental health workforce and providers. We want to pay for cultural consultation. So because um, almost 90% of our mental health professionals are white, we want to make sure that if they're serving um, a family from a culturally specific community, they can actually consult with a culturally specific mental health professional on what to do best. Community health workers often come from diverse communities. We'd like to set up a mental health training certificate program for them. Again, a way to expand our workforce. And the other thing we found is that both for kids and adult residential settings, we, they have no way to pay for interpreters. So we wanna create a fund so that they can actually bring interpreters in. And then of course, increase rate for our providers so that they can be viable. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we wanna change the definition of neglect. So if it's that the services aren't available, that doesn't mean that family is neglecting their child. We're trying to figure out a workaround for the Youth Act issue so we can go from 21 to 26. Um, the feds wouldn't let us do that, but we're trying to figure out a way to do it. Um, you might know that we really fought hard for a third pathway to residential. Um, if your child needs residential treatment due to their mental illness and has nothing to do with you as a parent, you should not have to go through child protection. You should not have to do a relative search. This isn't a sleepover. And so we did create a bill to do this, but the way the funding worked, it didn't work. So we have a fix to come back this session. Um, we wanna, again, increase the funds for our first episode of psychosis programs and expand that to early mood disorder programs. So for young people with serious depression or borderline personality disorder. We need to come up with some specialized settings for those kids that I mentioned that don't seem to you know, be served well in our system. Um, there is a program called Whatever It Takes um, that's used for adults. We wanna use the same thing for kids. We want to require private insurance to cover psychiatric residential treatment facilities. I think that it's truly awful that they're not covering it. Um, under state statute, they're supposed to cover residential and hospital. And they're saying that PRTFs are not residential. They're a Medicaid-only benefit, um, which is baloney. Um, so we're just going to require it. We would create a child mode for non-emergency medical transportation so kids can get to things like day treatment more easily um, and, frankly, more safely as well. Next slide. Um, 988 is an important piece um, in terms of implementing this. We don't want um, youth to have to call 911 if they're afraid. We don't want families to have to call the police as well. Even though in our statute, because of Travis's law, 911 is supposed to send out our mobile crisis teams, going to 988 just makes it simpler. And it's such an easy number to remember. Um, there is a bill, um, it's not a NAMI bill. We had one a couple of years ago to do this, but to actually put the 988 number on the back of school IDs so that kids would know this is a number to call. Um, for our grant programs that do work, we wanna increase their funds. We wanna increase respite care funds, um, but we also wanna make sure that families whose kids have high needs can actually access it regularly, not just like once during the summer when school is out. And we wanna expand it to families whose kids have been in the emergency room or use crisis services or lost their in-home staff, right? So that they can get that break. And again, more money for shelter linked, school linked and early childhood mental health. Um, we also wanna look at rate exceptions for certain kids um, who need a personal care attendant. If you have a child who is severely aggressive, you're not gonna find anyone to work with your child for $17 an hour just not going to happen. And so we want to increase the rate. And then we want to look at network adequacy because we want to make sure that people can actually access the care that they need and not have these narrow networks. So for the next three years, we require health plans in Minnesota to accept any provider who meets their, you know, kind of quality criteria and will take a contract so that we can really open up that network. And then in the meantime, we want the Department of Commerce to look at what are some better ways to measure network adequacy. Right now it's 30 minutes, 30 miles. Doesn't mean that you have a provider in your network that actually is taking new patients. Well, we need to fix that. Um, we need to make sure at this level that we can really get kids in to see who they need to. Next slide. Um, so that's kind of a, a, there are more things on the children's side. There's a lot more kind of technical things that they're looking at, but those are kind of the big, big picture things that we think we need to do to continue to build out our mental health system. Um, we are um, 
the Mental Health Legislative Network is, you know, working hard um, on all these different types of bills. We've got, you know, a bill for education, um, obviously a huge children's mental health bill. Um, and one of the other issues that you might be interested in is when you have a parent who is an MFIP child only, which means they're on social security, um, they don't have to work. That also means they can't access childcare. And so if you have a parent who needs intensive outpatient services for their mental illness and they have nowhere to leave their child, they're not going to access treatment. Or if they're not doing well, you know that we want children to be with an adult who can consistently respond to them. So on the recommendation of a mental health professional, we would um, provide 20 hours of child care a week for those families. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, take questions or comments at this time. Well, for starters, Sue, there's one in the chat box. Um, so let's see. Um, how does there's a couple? How does a parent okay. drug use impact children? Uh, for example, parent removal, et cetera, versus better drug treatment. So I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but maybe you do. Hmm. Well, I think we were, you know, sometimes we've been, you know quick to remove a child from a home when the, when the parent is using, um, you know, illicit drugs. And I don't think our treatment system for substance use disorder is all that great. So making sure, again, that families can, uh, parents can get access to good treatment, treatment that works, I think is really an important piece of this. Because um, we know that you know, except in very extreme situations, right? It is very difficult for a child to be removed from the home. Um, and also what does CMIG stand for? That, that oh, mm -hmm. um, Cultural Ethnic Minority Infrastructure Grants. And so they really mm -hmm. help um, culturally specific mental health providers um, with things like um, allowing, paying them so they can provide supervision to staff. Um, you know, providing more culturally specific services, bringing in cultural healers, things like that. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm a recently retired ER physician and you're spot on in terms of it being in crisis and not having enough help for these kids, plus others with mental health issues. I had a question about um, changing the definition of neglect because I mean, the definition legally in Minnesota is, and I looked it up while what you were talking is, you know, the parent or caretaker willingly deprives a child of necessary food, clothing, shelter, health care, supervision, when the parent is reasonably able to make that provision, you know, and I think a lot of people think it's that a child isn't getting what they need, you know, such as they don't have clothing, but the parent can't supply it, then that's not a child protection issue. But I'm wondering if you have something different in mind when you say that. So they're also classifying it as abandonment um, because the parent won't take the child home. And, um, and we've had way, I mean, I've had way too many families that I've dealt with where they were charged with neglect um, and it wasn't really their fault. There were no services available for their child and they could not take them home and keep them safe. Um, one was actually told by an ER physician, um, bring your child home and lock them in a room and then just put like a porta potty in there um, and you know, hand in um, wet washcloths. I mean, for sure that parent would have been uh, reported to child protection if she had done that. It's a terrible situation. That's all I can say. I mean, we would have kids and adults in the ER for days or longer waiting to try and get them help. Yeah, but it's not the parent's fault. You know, it's the system's fault. And um, we also have to try to keep kids safe, you know, at the same time. And the pandemic has been really hard on them. So, Mark, if you have a question, you can just <clears throat> chime in because there's not, you know, uh, you just step up and ask. Well, one of the things I have, I actually try to be active with Minnesota Academy of Pediatrics, and uh, how much are they helpful to you? Um, I don't really have much interaction with them at all. Is that because they're not inviting you, or you don't know about them, or what? Um, you know, I know they exist, <laughs> um, and sometimes I've done stuff with the Minnesota Medical Association. Um, I think, you know, part of it is um, bandwidth, I'm sure, um, both on my part, you know, frankly, and probably theirs too, but it would be, 
it would be great if there was, you know, more connection. Definitely. It sounds like you need coalitions of pediatricians to kind of help doing the punching for you. <laughs> you know, I think if we all working together is helpful. The mental health legislative network is, you know, over 40 organizations, um, you know, that have come together to try to really, you know, build our mental health system and to make sure that we agree on things going forward. So we're not, you know, fighting in public at the legislature as well. Thank you. So maybe the academy should join. Is that the away from that? They they certainly could. It's a pretty wide. We have Children's Hospital as a member right now. Um, we, we clearly have all the other mental health professionals, the social workers, psychiatrists, you know, things like that. And we certainly welcome them to the table. So did I get it right that you said 12% of Adolescents attempted suicide? Um, yes, depending on which, let's see. That was an early slide and it just right. kind of struck me. <laughs> it kind of depends on, on which, which one, um, which study you're looking at, but um, mm -hmm. the student survey was, um, we look at 11th graders, 28% uh, actually considered suicide which is a pretty high number. That's a high number. It was the number that actually attempted it that I was. Oh, that was the CDC data. Yes, across the, across the country. So 26% had suicidal thoughts and 12% attempted. Wow, that, that just seems like a huge number. Do you know historically if that's high? Um, has it gone up over the last say, 20 years? Um, it's gone up a lot the last five years. Yeah. So it's been a rising concern. And, you know, a couple of years ago, one of the laws we passed was requiring teachers to have continuing education on suicide prevention, because we wanted to be sure they knew what those signs and symptoms were and what to do. So I think you'd, I think you'd have to know where that number came from, because I find that high. I think what I, I agree on is that it is a crisis in young people who are attempting suicide. Is it 12%? I would Guess not, but it is a crisis, and I agree with you that it needs to be addressed in the schools. I have a relative out in Montana who's a teacher, and they have the highest suicide rate, I think, in the country, and they've had multiple suicides, and she keeps going to the school saying, we need to talk about it, and they keep saying, if we talk about it, then there will be more, and they just won't engage, and I mean, that is also beyond tragic, you know? I agree. We were actually the first state in the country and it was back in like 2004 that required teachers to have continuing education on the early warning signs of mental illness in children so that they could see that what they were seeing in their classroom was not necessarily bad behavior, but symptoms. And that's been very helpful. And then we added the suicide prevention piece. And then I think having the school linked mental health providers in the school also mm -hmm. really does help with that um, as well. Um, one of the bills that we're, that we have this session as well is to creating um, two leads within the Minnesota Department of um, Education focused on children's mental health and adult mental health, um, because we want there to be someone in the department that knows the resources, for example, for more suicide prevention. What do you do if a student attempted? Um, what if you do if you don't have a school linked mental health provider? Is there, is there still a way that you can get some more resources into the school? And we're hoping that this year that bill will pass. Do you have any knowledge of? Um, children in child protection, if there's an automatic referral for therapy? In terms of being able to access it or? Well, even it being discussed, arranged, you know, in a mm -hmm. documented or a, a proven, say, maltreatment case, obviously you can't do that for every um, charge of, you know, mistreatment, but um, that's out of my area yeah, of knowledge. I just wonder, because those are the kids most traumatized in the severe cases, and are they getting the help that they need? Well, I would One say, so. <laughs> Lisa, that I don't know about caseloads overall, but when a case actually, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, gets to court and there's a CHIPS petition, you know, a child in need of protection and services, I don't, I don't have a number, but... Um, you know, from reading cases over the years, I would say probably a majority, if not most of them, get referred for mental health services by the courts. But, 
you know, do they actually get there? You know, uh, are the services available or it wasn't uh, several years ago, we looked at uh, children who were referred for mental health services who had been sexually abused. And it was three to six months before they could even get their initial consultation. So <clears throat> it gets the availability of resources. Yeah. Please, anybody jump in. There were a lot of things there. It might be something of interest to, to you particularly. Don't be shy. You know, we just welcome a conversation here. <clears throat> I'll ask you again. I'm interested in uh, decriminalizing our illegal drug laws uh, because uh, when we make it a criminal offense to use drugs, we greatly uh, reduce access to therapy and uh, there is limited therapy available. Uh, so I would uh, be curious how much you've had in, uh, involvement with uh, the issues of drug use, illegal drug use, and uh, children? Um, so not a lot. Um, we're having, uh, obviously, some uh, interaction with legalizing cannabis um, for a number of reasons, especially, you know, the connection to psychosis. Um, we think it should be age 26 before you can use it. We do support decriminalizing, um, especially marijuana doesn't make sense. We've thrown tons of people, frankly, into our criminal justice system that didn't need to be there. Um, they had small amounts, you know, they weren't like, you know, selling huge bricks or anything like that. And we've really disrupted a lot of families, especially from the BIPOC community for that. Um, so that one absolutely makes sense. Um, but we've not kind of ventured into that other area. And again, it's, it's just partly bandwidth, right? Um, there's only, we work on a lot and there's only so much, so so many things that we can work on at one time. Well, if if a say child protection services is involved with the family and illegal drugs are used in the among the parents, is that child usually removed? That I don't know. Well, I can respond just from you know as you all as I mentioned, I think uh, we're about finishing up a year long report on child fatalities in Minnesota from abuse. And this sort of cuts both ways, so I guess, you know, I'd be interested in your comment, but we, you know, we just saw a number of cases where uh, one or both parents were just chronically abusing drugs for six, eight years, and they would have the children removed for short periods of time and return, and they get into treatment, and then they'd relapse. With, and the end result was the child died from neglect, or the child was, you know, somebody just lost it and killed the child, especially infants. So on the one hand, you want to say, well, you know, we should provide mental health services to people who are abusing or substance abuse services, people who are abusing them. Um, but I think what we kind of saw from this and some of the research is that, yeah, if you do that pretty early on and it's available and it's pretty intensive, you can make a dent. But if it's six, eight years down the road and it's just returning children over and over again to really dangerous situations or where they're not getting fed or whatever, or the infant gets rolled over on its mother, you know, it's too late at that point, then you got to prioritize the kid, you know, so, mm -hmm. it, you know, I, you know, it's always sort of like, do you support the parents or do you support the kids? And the answer is both, but, you know, what you do depends on where you are in that continuum, I think. <clears throat> I, I think it's a real hard call. I, you know, I, I agree. It's not, there's not an easy answer to this at all. Um, Cause we have seen situations, right. Where, the parent gets good treatment. Um, they do recover. They're not relapsing. Um, and then other situations where you're right, relapse is often a part of recovery. It's not a straight sure. line. And that makes it, that makes it really difficult too. Yeah, no. So it's, it is a tough call, <clears throat> but um, you know, I guess what I'm, I'm just saying that at some point you have to, you know, be a priority for the safety of the child. And you, you know, some situations are much more extreme than others too. So, yeah. Did, what number did you say graduated that, came, that didn't get licensed? I thought I, I couldn't. About 3,000. That's a lot. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, um, so. What field? Social work or psychology or what? what's the field? All, all of the above. So um, it, that includes social workers, psychologists, marriage and family therapists, licensed professional clinical counselors. Um, I don't think LADCs. 
but yeah, it's a lot. And that's over, you know, a period of years, but still. So there's a chat from Anna Garza that says children, mental health school system. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Can you elaborate on Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure you read it. So I had a question. Um, I do, my question is just because I've attended other webinars from other states and I do see that Minnesota, we kind of lack on the mental health in the school system. I've noticed that um, like when I would talk to other people from another state, I think a, a lady said that in their school system, they work on hand to hand. You know what I mean? The children's mental health from the county in the school system, they, they work one to, on hand to hand. And I think they have like, it was like a folder, right? That it, it had, the, I don't want to say the whole information of the child, but pretty much saying that the child needed to be more, you know, you need to be more patient. You know, he's going through some tough stuff. And that, that's my question to you, Susan, or someone that can answer like, so why are we not um, pushing that um, here in Minnesota? I know um, they were seeing obviously the nervousness of obviously the county and then the school system because it's totally different. I, in my head, as a mother, I always thought like they work together. You know what I mean? Because I mean, it, it makes sense, right? We have social workers, we have child protective services. So why not, you know, get together and be able to um, to work together, you know, to make our kids um, life a little easier. Obviously, you know, I attended the schools here. I've also been through um, hard situations also when I was younger. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I am, I, I love pushing up mental health for children because I learned about ACEs and I am so strong about ACEs because I feel that if I would have in, you know, in school as a kid, when I was acting up, um, obviously I know the reason why I was acting up because I had so much trauma. I didn't know how to speak about it. So my thing is why why Sue do you think we're not doing that? Why we're not taking a step into going to the school system and, and, and do something about it? Because I feel like we're triggering some of these kids when we bring them into social workers. They ask about questions, then these kids just block it and then go home and then now they're triggered, right? So yes, that's my so question. we we actually have um more than other states. Um mental health professionals in the schools. It's through that school linked mental health grant. And that grant is in actually in 60% of school buildings in Minnesota. Um, mm -hmm. What we sometimes hear about is people say we, you know, we have the lowest ratio of school counselors. School counselors are not mental health professionals. And they've done a good job about talking about how there's not many of them, but they're part of the whole school support personnel. And so some schools might have more school social workers than school counselors, right? Or they might have a drug and alcohol counselor um, and not many nurses. And so all of them make up the school support personnel. But then our school linked mental health grants, we do have clinical social workers, you know, um, LMFTs. Um, you know, even psychologists, and they're co-locating in the schools and actually diagnosing and pro providing treatment to the kids. And, you know, they just, the kids just walk down the hall and are able to go see the therapist, which, you know, really makes it easy for families. So, um, but our mental health providers in our state are not funded, are not provided through the county, except in some rare situations, does a county run a mental health center. Most of them are done from, you know, our nonprofit community providers. And so that's why you're not necessarily gonna see the county involved, but you're gonna see that there are mental health professionals in the schools. Hennepin County, for example, um, the county puts in additional dollars so that those community providers can actually hire more staff to work with them in the schools. Does that help? It, it does. It's just, I, I would say the whole grant money and all that stuff, it just gets me frustrated because at the end of the day, and I think you girls, everyone will agree with me, obviously we're the taxpayers, we're paying for it. So why are we not focusing on our children, right? Because our children are the main, you know, are the main ones where they're going to get, they're going to grow up and they're the ones that we need to um, help and support. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. they grow up. And when, if they don't grow up with, you know, the support and then, you know, the needs that they need, then we don't have good, I said, people walking around, obviously, we're mm -hmm. walking, you know, there's people walking around with traumas and triggers waiting to happen. So, yes, I, I totally understand. So I think one of those are the things it's just how I said it gets me frustrated that it's all about the money. It's all about this and stuff instead of like, you know what, let's talk about it. How can we make it work? But mm -hmm. I totally get you, Susan. Yeah. And the governor does have more money for schooling. And remember, the grant money is only a piece of it because it's braided funding 
funding. So Medicaid covers it, you know, pays for the kids who are on um, Medicaid or Minnesota care and private insurance pays for those therapy visits too. Um, so it's not all taxpayer money, but it's, you know, if you have health insurance, it should be paying for some of this. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So it, it helps actually um, really expand the number of kids that we're able to see because we're not limiting it to frankly, kids in special ed um, or limiting it to um, kids on Medicaid. Hi, so um, Stephanie McCorkle here, just wanna jump in quick. Um, I wanna say I really appreciate what you just mentioned um, as far as uh, the way that um, schools have been addressing um, mental health and having, for example, social workers available um, for students. Um, My background before I came to Safe Passage was I was a public school um, teacher and um, worked in several districts, um, interned in several districts in Minnesota and also taught in many schools and I saw I saw school social workers doing amazing things with children and connecting with them. And it just, it just warms your heart just to see those kinds of connections going on for kids in the schools. So I just want to say, I, I did see that on the ground as a teacher and it's, it's happening. So um, I do want to say, you know, keeping that up. Um, my question, uh, I, I saw in your slideshow, um, one of the earlier slides talked about that 988 phone number. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. That's new to me. Um, so I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about, about that and like how that's um, sure. like a resource for, for children. So we, you know, for many years, we've had a national suicide lifeline, but it was, you know, 1-800, you know, blah, 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 a number that no one could remember. And so the federal government turned it into a three digit number, 988. So it's available across the country. Um, we have call centers in Minnesota that are answering about 90% of those calls. Um, we're not answering many texts or chat that's in the works. Um, and they're answered by, you know, someone else, but the call volume has gone up substantially when 988 went out last July. And so again, it's an easy number for people to remember. So they will, you'll get a, a, you know, kind of a, a warm, caring person on the other end of the phone who will talk to you. Um, they will take family members too. So if a parent is concerned about a child, they can call um, and talk to someone. And then um, if it's appropriate, the, the call center in Minnesota will actually connect the person to one of our mobile crisis teams if that's what's appropriate. So it's, you know, it's really the a suicide lifeline, but an easy number to remember. Great, thank you. Um, and one more question too, um, maybe bouncing off of the possibilities of the 988 um, hotline. So are there resources or um, directions for, for children to take if, for example, they are worried about a parent who may have um, like a mental health situation and you know maybe they're recognizing that their parent could benefit from some help, but maybe they don't know who to talk to or is there, is there someone that they can talk to about that and say, hey, you know, my parents, caregiver may need some help, but they just don't, they, they might not have the, the knowledge or the background to be able to speak to it. They just know that maybe mm-hmm. something's wrong. So, I mean, they could call 982 if they wanted to do that, if they were kind of old enough to figure that out. And otherwise, you know, I, I do think um, the school support personnel, the school social worker or psychologist is a really good place to start. Um, to say, you know, I'm worried, even the school nurse, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all of those people, I think, are in a good position to help kids. Great. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think we're at yeah. 3.30. Yeah, we're at the bottom of the hour. And um, and I think, well, you probably have to get back here and see what your staff are doing or what's going on at the legislature. So, Thank you, Sue, so very much. Uh, We really appreciate it. And we will um, hopefully be in touch in ways we maybe can support your agenda this year. So we can talk about that maybe later. But And thank you, everybody, for showing up again. uh, The next session's in a month. I think it's the 22nd. And it's going to be about some major changes in foster care uh, in Minnesota. So we hope to see you there. For the next meetings, will we automatically get those email invites? Or do we need a brief sign up? You probably can't escape them. We, uh, you know, we send <laughs> starting a couple of weeks uh, at a time, and if we repeat them several times. So you'll have several opportunities just to click on the link and sign up. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Yep, and you can also watch our social media channels. We always um, post um, little reminders about them as well: Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. 
So watch those as well. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Sue. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Okay. All right. Thank bye you. Bye. Take care.